I also just, I want to express my gratitude for being able to worship with you alongside our worship pastor, John. He, he works so diligently to bring us into the presence of God each week, and I'm just so thankful to be doing the work of ministry alongside him. We're in Ephesians chapter 1, and today we start. I, I get excited about a lot of things. But I am stoked about this passage. This is the passage that began the journey in my own heart to see God for who he is, and it radically transformed me. It gave me a zeal and a passion for God's word that has never left me. I pray that this happens to you as we walk through the book of Ephesians. Turn with me, if you will, Ephesians chapter 1, and we're going to start at verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves." In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. And he made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times have reached their fulfillment, to bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Now, the opening of this letter begins with a phrase, grace and peace. He says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints, to the believers, and you need to keep that in mind, this this passage is written specifically to believers. And he says, grace and peace. Now, he uses this phrase because the Romans and all the Greek-speaking people would commonly greet each other by saying, charis, which is the Greek word for grace or favor to you. So they would say grace to you instead of simply hello. They would say charis. But the Jews would say shalom, peace. And so Paul says charis and shalom. He's pointing to one of the major themes of this book, that by God's grace to us and peace through Christ, the Jews and the Gentiles are going to become one big family according to God's, the riches of God's grace. Now what follows, verse 3 through 14, is one sentence in Greek. It's one sentence. And it reads like someone who is so excited, like somebody might know, to tell you about God and his character and what he has done that he can't do it but with one breath. With one breath. He gives us the magnificence and the magnitude and the riches of God's love for us, his grace for us, his character and his glory. Now this passage is both deep in its theology but it's simultaneously amazingly beautiful in its doxology. If you focus on the doctrine of the passage, you will get caught up, as many have done, in getting it right theologically, and you'll miss the beauty and the entire point of the passage. So I'd like for you to remember that this was written very specifically to believers who were already wrapped up in the reverie of God and his character and his love for them. It's written to you if indeed you are in Christ. Now I'm going to skip ahead just to get to this here. You will see this phrase many, many times in the book of Ephesians because Paul wants us to remember how all of this happened. It happened to us in Christ. You know, and another note about this church, VCF, because You know, having been here now for almost six years, I've noticed something really unique about our church. There is a vast array or diversity of theological positions. 
And yet, here you are, all together, side by side. Paul, in this letter, doesn't want uh, uniformity, everybody thinking the same thing and thinking they're right. He wants unity. That's a diversity of thought and people who recognize that first and foremost, Christ is to be glorified. This church has differences of opinions in theology, and I've had conversations with many of you, and yet, for the sake of unity, you want to be together. I want not only to encourage that, I want to bolster that. I want that to continue in greater measure, that we would be in awe and enamored by God's character so much that our theology and doctrine takes a back seat. Though we need it, we need our doctrine, we need good theology, it will drive us to a greater love for God, but unity will bring us together. So Paul begins by saying, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Now, for a Hebrew, they would use blessing in two ways. A blessing is something you receive for greater flourishing, but a blessing is also something that you give to praise someone. So Paul says, blessed be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every blessing. Bless God for blessing us with blessings. That's essentially what he says. Now, a blessing, these blessings, he says, are from heaven, the heavenly realms, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Now, you could bless someone in this way. Let's say that you want to go to college, but it's really expensive, and you don't know how you're going to pay for it, and someone comes up to you and says, I'm going to pay for you to go to school. Now, that's a blessing, but it's a material blessing, and it's, it's earthly possible. Let's take it a step further. Let's say that you have an incurable disease, and someone who loves you spends years and years and years doing research and studying and they're in the lab, and they discover a cure, and they give you that cure as a gift free of charge. That is also a blessing, but it's possible within the realm of earth. These blessings that Paul is going to list, one after another with excitement, are impossible apart from the person and work of Christ. They are miraculous gifts that God gives. They are heavenly blessings, and they come from the heavenly realm. They are not natural blessings. They are supernatural blessings, supernatural abundance of life. They only come from God, and the fact that they are heavenly by nature means that they are supernatural. And they can only happen in Christ. Something we must understand if we're going to get this passage is this phrase, in Christ. Paul uses it over and over again. In him, in Christ, in Jesus. Being in Christ means that we are in union and communion with Christ in such a way that, as theologian Stephen Lawson would say, what is true of Christ has become true of us. His grace and resources become our experience and possession. Christ's righteousness is now your righteousness. Christ's victory over sin and death is now your victory over sin and death. If you are in Christ, I was talking with a friend, Amy Piersma, last night, and she reminded me that in addition to that, Jesus' story is your story because he is your family. It's your heritage when you become a believer that Jesus is your family. Now, this is kind of a lame analogy, but I feel like it'll get us a few yards closer. So, you know when you hear someone talk about a football game, and they're like, oh man, we were 27 yards to the end zone, and then Mahomes got sacked. And then the very next play, he throws it in for a touchdown, and we caught it, and we won the game. It was crazy because we were behind, but then we won. And you're like, we? (laughs) Who's we? Do you mean Mahomes and Jones? Because if I recall, you were sitting on the couch eating a bag of Doritos and downing a Mountain Dew. (laughs) They did all the work. 
But this person so identifies themselves with the Kansas City Chiefs, they've got the jersey on, they're watching the game, they're rooting for their team, that their victory becomes their victory. Now, here's where the analogy breaks down, because the Kansas City Chiefs will probably lose (laughs) at some point. But Jesus Christ has never lost. Jesus Christ has procured the victory for us, and he reigns supreme. He will never lose. He He remains undefeated for all of eternity. And you don't just identify yourself with Jesus in a superficial way. You put on your best Sunday clothes when you go to church and you identify yourself as a Christian. You don't just wear Jesus from time to time around your neck. No, it's not superficial. This is something that has happened inside of you and has completely transformed your identity. If you are in Christ, he is in you by his spirit. You're not adjacent to Jesus. You're not beside Jesus. You are in in Christ, and he is in you. That is your new identity. At the very center of your identity, internally, are all of the attributes of Christ accessible to you if you apply them by way of the Holy Spirit that he's given you. Now look at verse 4. It says, for he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ, in accordance with the pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. Now, this passage has the potential to cause division. How do I know that? Because I can look back in church history and see the great divide between those who place a greater emphasis on God's ultimate power, God's sovereignty, God's wisdom, and those who play, uh, place a greater emphasis on man's responsibility, man's potential for goodness apart from God, and man's total free will. If we get caught up in, the, in these doctrines and these divides, if we get caught up, we will miss the beauty of this passage. We will miss what Paul is trying to say. He's trying to say, you, believer, have been given these incredible gifts that only God can give. And so he wants to give us a list of these gifts, and it's what we're going to walk through. The first gift, he says, is this. God has unimaginable love, cosmic-sized love and grace for the purpose of his glory. And he says, the first thing is that you were chosen. If you are in Christ, you were chosen by God the Father. God the Father chose you when? Before the creation of the world. Before you had an opportunity to do anything good or bad. He chose you before the creation of the world. And you weren't chosen just for you. You were chosen for him. You were chosen for the specific purpose of being holy and blameless in his sight. See, there's something going on here. From before time began... God had this enormous plan. He was writing this massive story, and you are a part of that story. He wrote it before the creation of the world, and he's been enacting it ever since. Now, you were chosen for what purpose? To be holy and blameless. And another phrase he uses is, he predestined us to be adopted as his sons. Now, pause for a second. This first blessing that he chose us only happens how? If we are in Christ. Say it with me. In Christ. That's the only way this happens. You are chosen before the foundation of the world in Christ. Now let's look at this second blessing. You were predestined to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with the pleasure of his will. Um, We just finished reading the book, uh, Anne of Green Gables. And Anne, it's it's awesome. It's like one of Navine's favorite books. Uh, And Navine started asking a lot of questions about adoption. And we also watched the movie Annie. All adoption, or all uh, orphans, I guess, are named Anne. Uh, And Annie is adopted by this guy named Daddy Warbucks and Anne of Green Gables by the Cuthberts. Now, in both of these cases, it's interesting. At first, they are not wanted. 
they, they don't want to adopt. Marilla was expecting a boy who would help out on the farm. Daddy Warbucks was also expecting a boy. Apparently, they're more desirable, I guess. But how did they become an orphan, Dad? That's what Navine wanted to know. How did they become an orphan? An orphan becomes an orphan when they are abandoned by their parents. And when they are adopted into a new family, something happens to them. They are provided for. They are given a home. They are given a last name. They are given a new identity. And these are all gifts that are totally outside of their control. But how is it that we are adopted? Who abandoned us? We were created by God in His image to be in relationship with Him. And as we went through the book of Genesis, you understood that we were in perfect relationship with Him. We had total and utter free will to follow God, to love Him as our Father. But someone abandoned someone else. And who was it? How did we become spiritual orphans? We abandoned God. We used our free will to run away from God, to go our own way, do our own thing, and live life according to our great pleasure and will. And it led to death. The reason why this passage is so particularly amazing is because in spite of us being not just unwanted, but completely unlovable, completely filled to the brim with wrongdoing and sin, going our own way and doing our own thing, God loved us so deeply that he said, I want you. I choose you. You're going to be a part of my family. I will adopt you. My identity becomes your identity. What has happened to me? Procuring your, your redemption, as we're going to see in a minute, is yours. Grace and mercy and love to you. God the Father predestined you to be adopted as a son or a daughter. You were predestined through the work and person of Jesus Christ. You were predestined according to God's pleasure and will. He had this in his mind before the foundation of the world. Now hold on a second. This is starting to break our categories. Do you really believe that God is that powerful? That God is really all-knowing? That he is really all-powerful and all-present? That he is holy? That God is totally sovereign? That God is so powerful that before time began, he can set forward in motion this massive plan of redemption? Do you believe that God is that powerful? Paul is trying to tell us, if you get caught up in the weeds with this doctrine, you'll miss what's going on, and you'll forget how big God's love is for you. So think about it in this way. God has given you these great gifts. He chose you. He adopted you. The motivation behind God doing all of this is his love for us. I give this definition all the time. What is love? Love is the sacrificial giving of yourself for the good of another person, even though they are undeserving and you may not get anything back at all. That's what God does. He loves us so much that he gave us Jesus Christ to take our sin away and give us a new identity and apply his righteousness to us so that we can be a part of his family. Paul goes on. He reminds us, this is in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. He actually pauses here for a second. Look at, look at verse 6. Verse 6, Paul says, you know, if we go back, oh, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's blessed us with every blessing in the spiritual realm. He's given us every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realm. He chose us. He predestined us to be adopted. And then he says, hold on. Oh. To the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. This isn't just a blessing. This is just true of God. And he wants to say, stop just a second. Because I've just told you two things that are almost incomprehensible and will take a lifetime to understand. So pause for a second and just think about God's grace. 
the magnitude of God's grace. What is grace? It's when you get a gift that you don't deserve. We are receiving these gifts, and it's breaking our categories because we don't understand what they are yet. You have to dive into the scriptures to fully understand these things. And he says, okay, don't freak out, grace. Remember God's grace? When he didn't overlook your sin, he looked at Christ who paid for your sin and then applied that grace, that mercy, that love, that righteousness to you. He says, just stop for a second and praise him. You know, you know, I think it actually might be, I was thinking about doing this this morning. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Now don't say amen yet because we're not done with the sermon. <laughs> Look what's happening here. You were chosen by God the Father. You were predestined and adopted by God the Father in Christ through Jesus the Son. Look where he's going in the passage. Because what we're going to see here is God the Father had this massive plan. And who enacts the plan? God the Father through the Son by way of the Spirit. We see the Trinity here in this passage. There's such rich, thick, deep theology. It's incredible. And if you understand it, you're able to see the simplicity of grace. Through Christ, in Christ, you were redeemed and forgiven. Look at verse 7. In him, in Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. He gave us redemption. We just went through the book of Ruth, and we talked all about what redemption is. It's, it's a ransom payment for someone who has been imprisoned, and you buy them back. I want to uh, just give you an analogy real quick. Imagine that you're in prison. You're in prison because you committed a terrible crime, a heinous crime. The second you are convicted and the second you are sent to prison, you deeply regret what you have done. You have massive regret. But what is the purpose of prison? One of the primary purposes of prison. It's not just to keep you from the public, but it's to give you an opportunity to do very little but think and ruminate about what you've done. So you're sitting in prison and you think about your wrongdoing, the monotony of prison life. Over and over again, I did this. This is a prison of my own making. Over and over and over again, you're unable to resolve it, pay for it, reverse it, change it. You're sitting in a prison physically, but you're also trapped in the prison of your own mind, of, forgiveness of, uh, of unforgiveness and of despair, no chance of reconciliation or healing. So many people live in a prison of their own making, in their mind, ruminating on the wrongdoing done against you and your own failures. You sit in this prison, this cycle and recycle, and you have no idea what to do. Do you know who understood this when he met Jesus more, more perhaps than any other human being? The man who wrote this book. You know what he used to do? Murder people. He used to kill and persecute Christians. And when he met Jesus... He was physically blinded and spiritually suddenly could see. And he recognized and understood the depth and depravity of his own sin. And in light of his depravity and sin, he saw the glory and riches and magnitude of Jesus' character. And he was cut to the heart. I am the worst of sinners, Paul says. Now imagine sitting in prison, 
wallowing in despair, and suddenly the prison door flings open, and who's standing there but the man that you did wrong against? And he says with a smile on his face, I forgive you. You are totally forgiven. Not only are you forgiven, the penalty that is due, I have paid for it myself. You are free. The prison doors are open. I've paid the ransom. You are free. You are redeemed. You are forgiven. This is why Paul is so stoked to share the magnificence of God's character. He's like, I have to give you an 11 verse run on sentence. And actually, it's not even a run on sentence. A run on sentence is when you have two disconnected uh, clauses and, and it's not divided and you continue. This is one continuous thought. Paul just goes on and on and on. Why? Because he's been set free from prison. And if you've been set free, you understand this. And if you don't understand this, you can be set free too. Jesus has come for you. Now, those who do not believe, they're not chosen and adopted and forgiven and redeemed. But if you come to faith in Christ, you are chosen and adopted and redeemed. And you don't know it until you come to faith in Christ. How does this all happen? Church, in Christ. Jesus is here now. He's for us. And these blessings are ours. We get this. We get these things because of what Jesus has done. Look at verse 9. And he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times will reach their fulfillment to bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Christ. Now, this is, this is like level 10 theology stuff right here. This is like drinking from a fire hose. And now, the, the mystery, what he's talking about here, the mystery revealed, we're going to see it unpacked as we look in, in the book. He's going to describe this mystery a few other times. And the mystery is simply this. So, spoiler. Christ has unified the Jews and the Gentiles to become one church, the bride of Christ for the sake of unity, and for the sake, ultimately, of his glory. And when is he going to do this? Well, he revealed the mystery of his will. Why? Because it pleased him. Because he's an incredible author, and he wrote the most incredible story, and it's still <laughs> happening. God's will, previously unknown to mankind, which, by the way, is what this word mystery means, it simply means it was beforehand not known. But now it is known in the person and work of Christ, and it was acted and revealed according to its purpose in Christ. And the purpose was to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth. See, God isn't just reconciling man with God. He's also reconciling man with man so that we will all be unified. And he is unifying when he returns, when King Jesus returns, he's already established his kingdom in this way. He's gathering the citizens to himself, unifying Jews and Gentiles, bringing them all together under one head. And someday his kingdom, coming down like a beautiful bride, will rest here on earth and God's habitation will be with man once again. This is what we all look forward to. The, the new heavens and the new earth with new bodies that will never see decay. And we can live as God has always intended us to live, in relationship with him and a perfect relationship with one another, bringing him praise and glory and honor. Now, the revelation of this mystery is enormous. That one day God will redeem back to himself all things according to his perfect plan and design. That in Christ, that in Christ, all of these things will happen. Those who were once scattered and far away are now brought near in perfect unity with God and man and will reside in Jesus' new kingdom. Now, like I said, this is... To understand this requires intense study of the Scriptures. And the more that you study the Scriptures, literally just this week, 
something was revealed to me that I had previously never seen before. And I've been intensely studying the scriptures for 20 years. It will continue. You will continue to see new things. But Paul doesn't want you to miss the beauty of it. He wants you to see it in its simplest form. Um, you guys ever see the movie Top Gun? Uh, the first one? So, uh, you know, when I was a kid, I had posters on my wall of like F-14 Tomcats, F-16s. I was really into fighter jets. Now, when you watch Top Gun, they could say, you know, the, the airplane comes on the screen, they could say, the Gruen F-14 Tomcat is an American carrier-capable supersonic twin jet, twin seat, twin tail, all-weather capable, variable speed wind uh, aircraft. And it can climb 30,000 feet in 60 seconds. It has a cruising altitude of 600 miles an hour, but is capable of reaching a speed of just over Mach 2 at 1,550 miles an hour. Now, they could voice over that while the plane's flying around, but what do they do? <laughs> And you're like, <sighs> that's, why do they do that? Now, because anybody can understand that, they hear the power and sound of those twin turbo jets, and they hear the soaring, ripping solo on the guitar, and they're like, yeah! <laughs> you don't have to know a single thing about, you might just be like, yeah, I love airplanes! But who appreciates it more than anyone else? The nerds! They're sitting there and they're like, an F-14 Tomcat is an aircraft capable. <laughs> like they're going through their mind and the hair on the back of their neck is standing up. Why? Because they do understand how complex that machine is, how long it took and how many dollars it took to build that thing and how hard it is to fly it and what it's capable of. They understand the nitty gritties of it, but it moves them all the, the same to see it soar in the air. Now, you know, to understand these things, unfortunately, some people look at this passage and they say, I, I don't get it. It's too complicated. Uh, maybe someday someone will explain it to me, but it, for now it's just too much. And it reminded me of this little clip. Uh, Robin, you can get ready to pull this up. From one of my favorite films, Amadeus. It's a biopic about Mozart. Uh, just, w watch this clip. Well, how Mozart? A good effort. Oh, well, decidedly that. An excellent effort. You have shown us something quite new tonight. Uh, of course, now and then, just, just, just now and then, it, 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 it seemed a touch... Um, How shall one say, Director? Too many notes, Your Majesty. Exactly. Very well put. Too many notes. There are just as many notes, Majesty, as are required, neither more nor less. Well, my dear fellow, there, there are, in fact, only so many notes the ear can hear in the course of an evening. My dear young man, don't take it too hard. Your work is ingenious. It's quality work. And there are simply too many notes. That's all. Just cut a few and it'll be perfect. I want to tell you one last story. When I was 11 years old, um, I found a, I was actually, I think I was between 10 and 11, I found a guitar in uh, my uncle and aunt who had abandoned their house and it just sat empty for years. I found a guitar in a closet and that is how I started playing the guitar. I started, you know, self-taught, had a friend, uh, you know, tune it up for me and then I was just working out the chords. And uh, as I made my way to junior high, my band teacher had this incredible stereo in his office. He was kind of an audiophile obsessed with high quality sound. And, and he said, hey, you got to listen to this in here. It sounds incredible. And he slapped a, a record on the player. And it was a song by Van Halen called Eruption. And I don't know if you've heard that song. 
But to an 11 year old, it was the most blistering, face melting solo <laughs> I have ever heard in my life. And I sat there in that office, mind blown. I had no idea what was going on. But I did know that I wanted to know guitar better. I did know that. I said, I may not understand what's going on, but I want to know better. This is the prayer that Paul prays for you in the next passage. Simply that you would know God better. That you wouldn't think, oh, there's just too many notes. That you wouldn't miss the fact that this is so complex and so complicated and is going to require some theological duking out with my home group to understand that you wouldn't get so caught up in that that you miss the beauty of this soaring, incredible truth about God's love for you. God has written this incredibly complex, massive, incomprehensible plan of redemption that's taken all of human history to play out. He wrote it before the dawn of time, and we are all like musicians in, playing, in the playing of this great orchestra that extends back to the very beginning of time. It's the magnum opus of God's piece called His Story. And here we are at the climax of the piece in Christ, the mystery revealed that God is reconciling and redeeming humanity by the riches of His grace and the magnitude of His love, and all of it for the purpose of His glory. Simply that God Himself might hear the music of the universe he created and hear it playing to the praise of his glorious grace. I want us as a church to be unified by one thing, the magnitude of God. That we can look at an almighty, holy, sovereign, incredible, powerful God and say, he is mine forever and I am his in Christ. If that's your identity, you don't have to understand the doctrine or theology of this, but my prayer is that you would desire to, that you would desire to know him better, that you would see both the soaring reality of God's grace and love and the riches of his love for you, but that you would also desire to know him better. Can we pray that together as a church, that God would allow us to know him better? Father, are you have chosen us, you've adopted us, you've redeemed us, you've forgiven us, you've predestined us, you, you have given us all of these gifts in Christ. It's only by his work, his obedience, his faithful obedience, all the way up until death on a cross, that we have these riches, that we have them, as it says, we have redemption. This is available to us today, right now, here in this room. Father, all we need is the tiniest faith to believe that if we seek you, we will find you. If we knock, the door will be opened. That you stand with open arms, smiling, reaching out to us to say, come know me better. Father, I pray that we would run to you. We wouldn't be scared off or, or think, ah, oh, too many notes, too, too much. But that we would be reminded that we can take it one day at a time, that we could walk with you one step at a time, growing in our knowledge and love for you as we go, and that you will reveal to us, you will continue to reveal to us the magnificent glories and riches of your grace and character. Help us to see you, God. Help us to know you. We want to know you better, God. Thank you that you promised that you'll never leave us or forsake us and you promised that you are with us all the way until the very end because you've given us your spirit. And next, uh, in the next couple weeks, as we discover that you have given us your spirit as a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance and that we can know these things as we pursue you, I pray that you would remind us that you are right there. That you aren't just adjacent to us, that you're not somewhere close by, but you are in us working through us that we might know you. We love you, God. Thank you for the, the profundity of this mystery, the beauty of it, 
the glory of it. Thank you for its complexity. But Father, most of all, we praise you and we just want to give you glory because you are awesome. We love you, God, and we praise your name. Amen.